I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not a Pipe Podcast. Before I get started with the interview today, I just want to say thank you, especially to those of you who have been listening for two years now. If you like what you're hearing, whether this is the first time or the 40th interview you've listened to, 42nd now, I think, please help support the podcast by writing reviews, posting and reposting, tweeting and retweeting. All of this really helps, as well as, of course, sending a donation or clicking on and ordering one of the books that we recommend online. All of that helps keep the podcast afloat and keeps us engaged with this project. So I appreciate it. In the spirit of critical engagement with cultural studies, philosophy, critical theory, I'm starting this season with Kathleen Fitzpatrick, author of Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University. Kathleen is a director of digital humanities and professor of English at Michigan State University. She's also the author of Planned Obsolescence, Publishing Technology and the Future of the Academy. She's a really interesting person doing really great work and it's an honor to be able to speak with her today. It's also interesting that this concept of generous thinking, which is what her book is about, seems like a somewhat obvious solution to a lot of the things that we do in the university. I mean, why not think generously? However, putting that into practice and getting people who have in many ways been trained to sort of attack intellectually rather than think with and through ideas can actually be quite a challenge. And so it's a really interesting book that I encourage anyone to read who hasn't. Kathleen, thank you very much for being on the show. I thought maybe we could start with how you came about this project. You talk about a few things, sort of big picture, 2016 election, for example, some of the things that were going on in the news. You also talk about personal experience, like hosting a graduate seminar, when I believe this idea of generous thinking seemed to really take shape for you. Can you say a little bit about how this book, Generous Thinking, got started? You know, it's a really good question. There were several different points of entry for me into this project, several places at which I sort of looked up and thought, we really have to work more on on a kind of generosity in public discourse. And that has to start with the university. You know, one of those places where the project began was that anecdote from the introduction to the book in which I'm, I'm in a graduate seminar and my students are, you know, immediately mobilized in dealing with the text toward tearing it down rather than really working with the idea that's in front of them. And I thought, you know, there's something in that mode of academic culture. Clearly, these graduate students have learned that from us and that we are in a mode in which the ways that we critique one another um, are often not productive, and they're often um, not leading toward the development of something new, but instead, toward the, the kind of demonstration of smartness that, that happens so often in the seminar room. So I, th- I thought there was something in there that I wanted to work on, but that was years and years ago. And I found myself in various communities online and in other kinds of academic conversations, finding an atmosphere of distrust and an atmosphere of just uncertainty about the goodwill of the the folks around us, an assumption that we were working at cross purposes that was making it increasingly difficult, I think, within the academy to have certain kinds of conversations that we need to have and making it all but impossible for the academy to talk with the world around the university. And so it, it was just a sort of gradual accretion of experiences that made me think, you know, first of all, the university is in a terrible bind right now in which we're discovering that in a very, very short period of time, the American public has been led to lose faith in the university as an institution. And secondly, we're now seeing the results of that loss of faith, both in terms of the defunding of institutions and of the difficulty we're having in public spaces, thinking through collectively and productively the very difficult issues that we're facing as a culture. And so I thought to myself, you know, if the future of our culture is really dependent on our ability to be able to communicate with one another in more productive, more positive ways, and if the future of the university is in question, it might be worth us stopping and thinking about how we're connecting and communicating with the world around us, with that public that the university is meant to serve. So 
that was a, a big part of where the, the desire to get this project out into the world and to really think with people about what what the university might become if we could talk to one another more productively might be. So Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of funny and maybe sad thing is that that kind of idea about generous thinking and productively speaking with one another is kind of an out there idea in academia today, it seems. How did you start to think about, I guess, introducing that idea, which on one level seems, you know, very easy and most people, uh, I can't imagine disagreeing with the basic tenets of generous thinking. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there is this, there's a competition for limited resources. There's also weariness and a, a sort of on edge, especially with critical scholars, that as soon as you say something, we tend to look for the flaws in that as opposed to, I don't know, generously thinking about what you're actually bringing to the table. How did you start to negotiate introducing that topic? Yeah. And I know you did stuff online, you did stuff in terms of public discourse, and of course, writing this book is one thing. But how did you start to introduce that knowing that it could be interpreted as, oh, well, she's not being critical, therefore she's not being intelligent, therefore she doesn't belong in this conversation? How did you start with that? Yeah. Well, it, it really began um, with a series of blog posts that I had been writing on on my blog, obviously, over a period of months. And I didn't approach those posts thinking that I had something longer in mind. I mean, they were really just something that was nagging at me and that I wanted to publish something about and see if I could open up a conversation about what more productive ways of engaging both with, between scholars and between scholars in the broader world might look like. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in these posts, first of all, they, they all seemed to strike a nerve. I got a lot of really strong response from people who felt like there were parts of their academic lives that they weren't being allowed to live out, parts of their values that they weren't able to fully manifest in the ways that they were working that they felt very strongly about wanting to bring forward and to talk about and to, to participate in a discussion around. So I found that those blog posts really, like I said, struck a nerve, but they also didn't resolve the question for me. This is where, frankly, my last two books have come from, is feeling like I had something, you know, some little niggling thing that I wanted to, to talk about writing a blog post, realizing that's not enough, writing some more about it and realizing that I'm returning to the idea over and over again. And that, you know, maybe this needs to be something larger than just a, a series of blog posts and, you know, beginning to think about it in the context of the book. So the first bits of the book that I put out there were in that context were just really super informal blog posts that circulated on Twitter and that people found their way to however people find their way to blog posts these days. Mm -hmm. The next thing, I mean, after I really started thinking more seriously about this and thinking about it as a form of, of writing that I wanted to make more formal, I had been invited to give a talk at a, a university that I, you know, had always wanted to visit, University of Richmond, um, which, you know, they thought they were bringing me in to, to talk about digital humanities stuff. <laughs> and I, I came in instead, you know, wanting to talk about generosity. And it was, um, it was an interesting experience, both for me and I think for the folks who were in attendance who weren't really expecting this talk, in part because, I mean, the, the, the folks who attended the talk were not all from the university. They were, they were folks from the surrounding city who were participating in some, some public events there. And this talk and its emphasis on really reaching out to the public and drawing them into the concerns and interests of the university, I think, spoke to them in some interesting ways. You know, and the talk was well received, and I did get some interesting, I'm not going to say pushback, it was critical comments on, you know, ways in which perhaps I want, I might want to push my thinking in a slightly more critical direction. The comment after that talk that really stuck with me was one scholar who said, you know, the choice to write and talk about generosity is a really canny one because nobody wants to be looked at as an ungenerous jerk <laughs> in how they respond to you. And I had that same response. You know, I laughed and I thought this was really funny. But at the same time, I realized that it would be all too easy for me to use generosity as a shield mm -hmm. and to be able to say, you can't critique my ideas because that's ungenerous. And that's not at all where I wanted to go. So it was that moment at which I realized that generous thinking and critical thinking are not opposed concepts, right? It's not as though we need to undermine 
and do away with critique entirely or otherwise we're at one another's throats. There was something else that was making criticism, which has underneath it a deeply generous impulse, right? That generosity of saying, I hear your ideas and I'm listening to them carefully and I think you can make them better and I am going to share with you my thoughts about how. It's an enormously generous move that we enact with each other all the time in peer review processes. We do this with our students. It's a really important part of the generosity of what the university does. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there are things that are obstacles toward, that are obstacles that keep us from making that critical work as generous as it might be. And I started thinking about what those obstacles might be. And that's where I ran headlong into the notion of competition. That as in the graduate seminar room, there is this sense in which we have to demonstrate brilliance. And one of the easy ways to demonstrate brilliance is by pointing out how how non-brilliant everything else is. And similarly, you know, among academic colleagues, we feel as though we are always competing for limited resources within our institutions, for limited acclaim within our fields. And our departments are similarly competing for limited resources within the colleges and universities, Mm -hmm. and universities are competing for limited resources across the sector. The longer I looked at that competition, the more I began to realize that those processes that pit us against one another or that make us even think that we could be pitted against one another, that somehow or another the work that we're doing is so individual and individuated, that it doesn't require positive communication and collaboration with our colleagues, that's where generosity starts to break down. And so the the process of writing the book really turned me from what at first looked like it was going to be, you know, another kind of diatribe against critique, and instead toward really thinking about what the processes of individualization, of competition, of privatization within the university are, and how they constrain the ways that we work with one another and with the public. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack with that. One thing that strikes me is the idea that Being generous and going forward with that mentality of trying to literally listen and help and hear what people are saying, as opposed to just waiting for your own opportunity to show how smart you are, Mm -hmm. it sounds, and I think it is, a great approach. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how to work within that framework personally and hopefully as a group, like you said, but also while clearly facing either outside opposition, like these groups that you mentioned sort of briefly, but I've actually, I've just seen them recently posting lists of courses they don't like. Uh, Mm -hmm. I can't even remember the name of these groups, but... um, I know the ones you're talking about. We've all kind of seen that, and it tends to be things about minorities, uh, queer studies, anything to do with socialism whatsoever, and uh, and there's a lot of complaints. You're not going to be reciprocated with generosity. No. And that may occur on the campus, but also definitely outside of the campus in a lot of political venues. How do you approach ungenerous thinkers while trying to remain generous? That is an extraordinarily difficult question, and I wish I had an answer to it, (laughs) because I feel like (laughs) I could solve a whole lot for us if I I knew how to do that. And I I really, I mean, it's one of the important parts of, of writing the book for me was really needing at moments to admit where I don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. That's one of the places. I do know that there are some of us who work on university campuses who are safer than others in making those approaches to opposing groups and in attempting to have conversations with them that might help begin to show them some of what it is we do on campus rather than what it is they think we do on campus. Mm -hmm. And to really attempt to find out a bit more about why why they think the ways that they do. There are others of us on campus who are not safe making those approaches, who are going to be attacked, whether personally or as part of a group. I do not want to put anyone in that position. I do not want at all to suggest that everyone needs to be listening to everybody who disagrees with us, because I think that's not, it's not viable. But I do think that there are some really extraordinary examples of scholars who have reached out to people who are in extreme political opposition to them 
who have carried on conversations um, with them that have, if not changed minds, at least opened up certain kinds of trust with those those other communities. So I'm thinking here, and I refer to this in the book, of Arlie Russell Hochschild's Strangers in Their Own Land, which mm-hmm. I find both an extraordinary book for the particular kinds of conversations that she's attempting to have, really attempting to figure out how Tea Party Republicans in Louisiana who are living in an area that has been environmentally devastated by the oil industry could possibly be arguing that the EPA is a bad thing and should not be interfering in the work of those corporations within Louisiana. I mean, it's it's a really, she sets out just to figure out how someone could think those two things at once. But in so doing, she opens up this method that really is entirely focused on listening, going into this community, sitting down with people at their kitchen tables, and asking them to tell her the story of how things got to be the way they are for them. Like, what, what do they think? Where did these beliefs come from? And then as she listens and attempts to sort of pull together what she thinks of as a deep narrative out of their story, she tells that story back to them, that narrative that she is constructing out of what she's hearing and asks, right, is this what you're saying? Right? Is, does this represent your experience? And they say, no, you know, that's not it. You've missed this part. Or no, I really don't think this thing. I think that thing. She course corrects and she revises and she rethinks and eventually gets to a place where she can represent back to the people to whom she is talking the experiences that they feel they have actually had. Her mind doesn't get changed in this. She doesn't necessarily want to support their narrative of how things got to be that way, and nor do they get dissuaded of the truth of their narrative. But they meet at some point in a place where they can hear one another. And that's a really remarkable achievement, I think. I mean, and Mm -hmm. it's sad that we have to work that hard even to get to that point where we can hear each other. But I think it's true. I mean, I think that's, that's where we are right now. So again, I mean, I think that there are ways in which the university is under direct threat from the kinds of groups that you're talking about. And those groups may not be the ones that we want to talk to directly, because these are groups that in many ways want to dismantle the institution as it stands. But there are people, they may be our friends and families. They may be people who surround the institution who don't know why they should defend it or why they should care about it. And our having conversations with them and helping them see what the importance of the university for their community and for their lives might be, might help us build a broader community of supporters that can help us when we need help. I was familiar with a lot of the books you referenced, but definitely not Strangers in Their Own Land, which sounds like a a really important thing, but also something that I would never personally want to do myself. And I think a lot of us probably wouldn't want to do that kind of work Mm -hmm. because it's so, well, it makes you vulnerable in many ways. Yes. It's also not something that ironically, very many of us are trained in in any ways to listen the way that you're talking about and the way that she does in this book. But it, it raises an interesting point for me as well, which is what publics, and you do mention how there's not just this one general public that we should address in a singular, but what kind of groups do we pay attention to? Because Mm -hmm. we tend to pay the most attention to the people who are just like us, which is probably not very good strategy, basically. Mm -hmm. But then there are other groups. Sometimes I would much rather pretend that they don't exist. And I'm talking about the particularly hateful groups that in some ways have become louder in the last few years Mm -hmm. in America. Absolutely. And I bring this up sometimes with my students that, you know, a lot of people are saying that there needs to be diversity of thought in the university. And it's a very big problem that there are way more liberals than conservatives on campuses. And that sounds, I mean, not necessarily unreasonable. But then I like to push that and ask, you know, if we're talking about the history of slavery, should we bring pro-slavery and anti-slavery people in and make sure that they have an equal 50-50 voice, which is usually not met with the same kind of, yeah, let's hear that out because we're quickly and easily getting into more and more uncomfortable territory where I think most of us would agree, like pro-slavery people don't need half of the argument or to be represented fairly in the university. But how do we choose, I guess, what groups to speak with or to engage? I mean, we we don't want to be monolithic, but we also probably don't want to say like, okay, you hate these minorities, you hate these groups, let me better understand you. 
Right. Or do, or do we? Is there some reason that maybe we do want to do that? You know, I, uh, my immediate response is, of course, to say no. I think if we are, and as we have been for decades, utterly unsuccessfully, trying to build a community on campus that resembles the world a bit mm-hmm. more than than what it has, a community that is not just white, middle class, people who have come from a particular kind of educational background, but instead that represents the full diversity of what the U.S. is and should be, then we need to make sure that that community that we're building on campus is safe, that we understand ourselves not just as being people who look like us and who deserve to be on this campus, but that everyone who's a, who is on this campus, everyone who comes through this campus, owns this campus in the same way that we do. Mm-hmm. If we genuinely believe that, we need to make sure, again, those of us who are safe are willing to stand up for that community and say, I will not have other members of my community threatened by the hateful speech that you want to bring to my campus under the guise of free speech. If, you know, you want to give that hateful speech in a public place, I cannot stop you, but nor do I have to listen to it. I don't have to facilitate it either. I mean, these are extremely thorny issues, you know, because I think it's it's very easy right now for folks on the right to say, you're not listening to us because, you know, you, you are running these extremists off campus rather than allowing their speech to be heard. I mean, again, it, this, this gets into policy questions that I am probably not <laughs> the best equipped to address, not being a high level university administrator. But I do believe that we need to be thinking about whether in suggesting that there are people on the right that we are shutting down speech from and are not listening to, whether in fact there are other people on campus who we haven't been listening to for years that we ought to be paying more attention to and that we ought to be understanding more as being part of who we are on the campus. So I just am not sure that we have done a good enough job of really understanding that our community already needs work before we can turn our attention to, you know, thinking about those others Mm -hmm. that, that we do or don't want to be in some kind of conversation with. That that was not the clearest possible answer. (laughs) Well, Um, this this is murky territory for sure. And I, I mean, the way that you frame generous thinking makes perfect sense, I think, in terms of how to follow it until we run up to these situations where you want to be generous and listen and really, you know, try to understand. But then when that interlocutor is saying things that are, well, hateful is very easy to say, like, well, that's hate speech. I won't listen to that. Mm-hmm. I think the the murkier stuff is when we might interpret it as hate speech, but they are using the discourse that we, and I hate to use us and we, but I think it, it works in the university because we tend to admire and try to thrive on diversity, mm-hmm. diversity in many ways. But then that kind of language is used basically against the university to say, you're not diverse, you're not hearing diverse voices because I have these opinions. But uh, as you said, if it's a question of safety and a question of building an inclusive community, then diversity of opinion doesn't matter that much if that diverse opinion is that of hate. Yes. If that diverse opinion is there are people who don't belong here. Yeah then that it it's exclusionary it's not diverse but that's not usually how they're presented now in no, fact they're they're being not. sort of trained in some ways to present it in the discourse that we have been using for quite a while in the university which is right. to embrace diversity it is not without irony that i say that i think the american right has learned far better the lessons of postmodern theory mm-hmm. than the left ever did our sense That diversity means diversity of political opinion now, rather than diversity of life experience, that there is no such thing as scientific truth, Mm -hmm. you know, that that expertise is something to be dismantled. I mean, it is um, a real problem. And it's interesting to see the ways in which I think what, you know, passes for the left in the United States is needing to back up and say, wait, 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 actually, science does matter. 
actually there is a capital T truth in this particular issue that we're talking about. And actually there is time for intolerance when faced with intolerance. I mean, it's all extremely thorny and I don't have a good vocabulary for talking about this, which is why I find myself sort of stuttering around a little bit. But it's, I think, really important for us to think about how we can build a community that can stand together in some kind of solidarity, that can recognize that the interests that some of us have on campus are the interests that all of us have to defend and use that solidarity as a way to reach off campus to communities that have long, long been underserved by the university. So insofar as there are folks outside the university that I would really like to see us reach, doing a much better job of reaching out to and a mm -hmm. much better job of listening to, it's those communities that surround almost all of our urban universities, those communities that are frequently right outside our doorstep, but that don't understand the university as being something that has anything to do with them at all, because we have for so long kept them out. To really think about how communities of color and communities within our cities can really be brought into the campus to work with us as part of the publics that we serve. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned in here, and you're not the only scholar writing about this, that there seems to be a lacking vocabulary for us because we haven't quite developed it, where we can move in and out of the university or the, the that kind of setting in a way that we can share knowledge, but not to give it to people, but to actually engage in some kind of dialogue is, is difficult the way that things have been set up. Absolutely. I had a, a great conversation with a colleague here at MSU um, about a week ago in which he was telling me that, I mean, he works in the office on campus that specifically focuses on community-engaged scholarship. Mm -hmm. He was telling me that there's been a move in recent years in the understanding of what community engagement is in scholarly circles from a mode that's been sort of deficit oriented. There is this problem in the community and we, the university, must take our resources out there and go fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and shift away from that model to thinking about an asset model. Like There are strengths in this community around us, and we have strengths here on campus. And if we bring them together, we can build something pretty remarkable. That asset model has to start with the kind of listening that I'm talking about, really talking to the community, finding out what's happening there, finding out what they might want or need, what their hopes and interests are, and then seeing if the university has a role to play rather than parachuting in as we do and saying, you have this problem and we're going to fix it. Another issue with that is we have a very, at least in the humanities, specific vocabularies of the kind of work that we do based on often the intellectual traditions that we come from, which doesn't necessarily translate well, and we don't do that translating. And because of that, it gets either changed, simplified, put into, I don't know, phrases or popular discourse that we don't really see ourselves reflected in. Mm -hmm. And you make the point that part of that is because, yeah, we're not trying to engage with any other communities. And therefore, if they do get into the other communities, the kind of work we're doing, it's translated into ways that we probably don't recognize. So if we're interested in doing that, or if we're interested in, I guess, reaching a broader community than just our peers doing basically the same kind of work, maybe at other institutions, what are some strategies that you have seen to be particularly effective? The strategies that I talk about in the book start as simply as making sure that the work that we are writing and publishing um, as part of our scholarship is openly available and accessible, that people can get to it um, mm -hmm. without having to have access to a major research library. I mean, I think there are a lot of scholars who frequently get frustrated that the work that they're doing on issues, talk the issues that are being talked about in the public, doesn't turn to their scholarly research in order to help support arguments or help really, you know, make those issues richer and, and more broadly understood. And in part, the scholarship doesn't get brought into those public discussions because nobody can get to it. Nobody knows it's there. So finding ways to make sure that the work that we are doing is publicly visible and accessible is a key component. But in that, there's also the need 
and I think this is part of what you were gesturing toward, to make sure that the work that we're doing is publicly accessible in not just in publication venue, but also in register, Mm -hmm. right? That we write in a way that isn't dumbed down and it isn't pandering, but that's, that's really trying to draw a broader audience who's concerned about the same issues that we're concerned about into thinking about the issues the way that we do. And, you know, we find in a lot of fields, in gender studies, for instance, in African American studies, in media studies, in popular culture studies today, Mm -hmm. that we see that there's an enormous audience for this material that really cares about it and really wants to engage with it. And finding ways to bring that audience in and to be in dialogue with them around the material that we're working on. I think is really crucial to making sure that it's visible, that the work that happens on campus, that it's not just some ivory tower escape from the real world, writing about issues that don't really matter to anybody except other academics, but that, in fact, the work that's being done on campus speaks directly to the lives and the lived experiences of people and their concerns um, with the culture that, that we find ourselves in today. So, yeah, I mean, I I do think that we need to be thinking more about how to make those connections. And some of that can happen through the kinds of publications and publication practices that I just mentioned. But others, there are other ways of making those connections as well. And I keep thinking about a project like Baltimore Stories at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, in which the Humanities Center brought together community organizers and writers and folks from the university into a broad dialogue about what was happening in the city of Baltimore and about the narratives of race and culture that they were able to trace that they were all concerned about in this place. And the ability of just bringing people together to tell their own stories and to have those stories heard by people both from on campus and off campus I think is really crucial. I think the university has a really powerful convening ability to bring together those discussions. And the more that we can build those discussions around the interests of the surrounding community and around their concerns, um, the more likely those communities are to understand that the university is there for them. I mean, like you said, there's a number of venues and there's a number of ways in which they're changing. You highlight in the book, scholarly journals used to be very difficult to access if you didn't have libraries that had huge budgets. Now there's a lot of open access and there's a push towards open access. Mm -hmm. And that comes, of course, from from the internet and from digital technologies and the reduction of price and the easy distribution. But it doesn't necessarily translate into books, which are still seen as sort of the pinnacle or what you must attain in order to get tenure. And that may change, but it hasn't changed in the same kind of way. Right. And a lot of research, I think, or a lot of ways in which research is disseminated, there are possibilities with the technologies that we have, but there are also, depending on how you want to see it, traditions or holdouts or questions of what do we do with with the book, for example. Yeah. Where do you see stuff like publishing in university presses with physical books? Right now, it's still, as you sort of mentioned, it hasn't entered the open access the way that journals and and that kind of work has been right. uh, entering it. Do you think that that's, I don't know, sort of inevitable? Or do you think that the book will remain? I'm curious to hear a little bit more about where you see things going in that respect. Yeah, I think there are a bunch of different possibilities in front of us. I mean, we're seeing a lot of experimentation within university presses right now with new business models for open access publication of scholarly monographs. So there's a a project that's a joint project of the Association of Research Libraries, the American Association of Universities, and the mm, Association of University Presses that together have started a project called Tome, um, which is Towards an Open Monograph Environment. And in this project, university presses have signed on to say that with a subvention of what is not an enormous amount of money, but is more than most scholars can individually come up with, with this subvention, we will publish this monograph in an open access format and make it freely available to the world. And universities at the same time have signed on to the program saying, we will provide a certain number of these subventions to our faculty on an annual basis so that their work can get out 
as broadly and freely as possible. And I think, you know, it's been a slowly developing project. Um, there are not a tremendous number of titles out under the Tome project yet, but they're coming. And I, I am seeing on campus, we, MSU has signed on to the, the Tome project, both through the press and through the university. And I've been administering the university portion of this, the, the subventions that we provide for faculty to publish with these open access publishers. And I'm seeing growing interest among the faculty in thinking about how their work can benefit from being published in this open way. So, so I think that's one thing that's happening. But the other thing, and this is, this is going to be a heavier lift, because it requires us to really stop and think about what our tenure standards are or, and why, mm -hmm. and what it is that really matters to us in scholarship and scholarly communication. I think, honestly, we push too many junior scholars toward writing books because of our tenure standards, rather than because the thing that they're working on actually needs to be a book. And I would really love to see us, particularly in the fields that have been most book dependent, you know, English and history and, you know, a, a few other fields. But I would really love to see us think a little bit harder about that question and think about whether we might reserve the book for those projects that require a certain kind of big public audience that then, you know, those books that sell enough become financially viable and our presses can keep going. While other kinds of work that that really is speaking more to a smaller audience, to one another, that is intended for an academic readership, might instead um, be better published in another form, that might take on the form of a series of interconnected journal articles, or that, you know, coming from my digital humanities side, that might be instead an online project that can be engaged with over time. I, on the one hand, really want to see the book as a form thrive and the publishers that publish them thrive because they do an, an enormous service mm -hmm. to our fields. But I also worry that we're defaulting to the book as a form and granting it a kind of prestige that isn't serving any of us. It isn't serving the scholars. It isn't serving the institutions. It isn't serving readers. It isn't serving the presses as well as other forms might. Right. So, I mean, again, it's a tangled set of thoughts. I do think that there are ways in which opening up the scholarly monograph so that more people can read it will be an enormous help to its audience. But I also think that we really need to think long and hard about whether the things that we're publishing really ought to be books. Yeah, I guess the pushback that I'm sure you've heard that I think a lot of people discussing this come up with is that if you get rid of, first of all, the prestige is nice, but I think the main thing is that the idea that if you replace publishing an, with an academic press, a monograph with, let's say, more blog posts or more online content or, I don't know, outreach to the community, then there's something missing in terms of rigor or there's something missing in terms of professional development that just only the book, for example, can, can yeah. serve. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with that, but have you seen ways in which maybe we can start to value other kinds of work without falling into that where it's just like, you know, do whatever you want or publish wherever you want? Because, of course, tenure committees aren't going to like that kind of thing. And, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And there, there, I mean, yeah, there are clear differences between someone who has, you know, sat down, dedicated two years of their life to something versus somebody who's done YouTube videos that may be very popular. But if far more people are watching these YouTube videos than are ever going to read a certain very specialized book, how do we sort of weigh the pros and cons, especially within the academy? Yeah, I, I mean, I think these are really important questions for us to think through. And I think we're likely to need to do a lot of experimentation and a lot of um, uh, wrestling with what the relationship between readership and impact is um, and what the relationship between rigor and quality mm -hmm. might be. You know, on that question of rigor, the, the key thing that 
you know, we hear a lot about online publishing and, um, you know, anybody could publish anything online and the, mm-hmm. the lack of peer review that certain um, online forms have is the sense that, you know, the university press, which has established and maintains really extraordinarily important standards for peer review, how it's conducted, how texts get edited and approved and so forth, that that is the pinnacle of rigor. That is the most important way that we could possibly get material of quality out into circulation. And, you know, I understand why we say that. I think that process, as I've just said, is extremely important and it's it, it has really contributed enormously to the development of scholarship in our fields. But I think there are other ways that that kind of work can get done. So just as an example, um, Generous Thinking was published by Johns Hopkins. And in my negotiations with Hopkins for how we were going to go about publishing this book, um, we came mutually to the idea that I would do an open peer review process online, that instead of them sending out the manuscript to the conventional two or three reviewers, that we would post the thing openly and we would seek comment and see if we could generate some dialogue and discussion that would help me really think about the book, how it was working, what kinds of revisions were needed and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we did this, you know, in, in February and March of 2018, opened up the entire draft manuscript as it stood. And I had a series of readers come through some of whom, you know, in the first couple of weeks, it was a relatively small number of invited readers. And then after that, there was a month in which the thing was completely open to any reader who wanted to come in and leave comments. And I announced it around all over the place and wound up with 40 readers who came through and left a bunch of comments and really discussed things with one another and discussed them with me and helped me see places where I really desperately needed to rethink my ideas. I mean, it wasn't as though opening it online and, you know, eliminating anonymity for the reviewers resulted in reviews that pulled their punches or that were all rainbows and unicorns. I mean, some <laughs> of these these comments were really deep critiques of the ways that I was approaching certain parts of, of the issues. And that experience, having 40 perspectives on this book that were coming from different places and with different interests, I think made the book as I revised it way better than it would have been with two or three standard readers' reports. And those standard readers' reports would have paid enormous attention to the text as well, but there's no escaping the fact that it's two or three people. And that for that reason, if no other, the, the, the range of experiences and perspectives that are brought to bear on the text are limited. So I think there are ways that we can construct processes online that have even more rigor than what we're used to, because we bring a community to bear on thinking about the work that we're doing collectively, and we hold one another accountable for the ways that that commenting happens, for the ways that revision happens, and so on. We have limited ourselves to certain forms of quality control within the academy that have served us well for quite a while, but that we might start thinking beyond in some ways that could be really productive. Yeah. I mean, I find the way that you describe doing this manuscript really interesting. And you talk about making sort of making yourself more vulnerable by putting it out there before it's finished, but also Mm -hmm. making it accessible and having a lot more effectively having a lot more stakeholders or building a community, like you just said. Exactly. I'm also wondering, though, in all of these invitations, I guess, to talk with more communities, to open ourselves up, to go beyond the academy and and these kinds of things, I also know that a lot of people, probably every person in academia is basically overworked or or doing more work than they ever did before. Absolutely. How do we prevent that from being something like a second, third, fourth shift or or however you want to phrase it, where, you know, you still have to teach your classes, you still have to publish in peer reviewed, whatever, you still have to do all these services, but also you now need to go out into the public and present your work. You now need to translate it into a more general talk for people. I mean, I'm just always weary now when I I hear ideas that how much more work is this going to be? Because I think we're, we're all very stretched. Yeah. So it's exciting what you're talking about, but it could also be used sort of as another thing you have to do. I mean, I'm reminded sort of of journalists who 
when early internet stuff and blogging and Twitter and all of this became more and more popular, they were told, you know, keep writing your stories, keep doing this, but also you have to post online every two hours or something like that. Right. Absolutely. It's hard to quantify and it's hard to put a value on. And, and if administrators can, generally, they're probably not going to pay you any more for it whatsoever. Right. How do we prevent that from uh, becoming overly burdensome? So this is the key question. And it's where I, I wind up landing near the end of the mm -hmm. book is in the need to radically rethink what our tenure and promotion standards are and our standards, you know, for annual reviews and merit increases and hiring and all of the other personnel processes that we participate in. I mean, right now, things are becoming increasingly quantified, mm -hmm. right? You have to produce a certain amount of stuff over the course of any given year in order to get credit for that stuff and be seen as worthy of a merit increase. The boxes that that stuff falls into are themselves ranked in terms of prestige, right? You produce a book and you get X number of points. You produce a peer-reviewed journal article in a top-tier journal, and that's this number of points and so forth. And so, yeah, in a system like that, where these are the things that count, anything that we add on top of it that looks like service falls to the bottom of the rankings. And everything that we, we add to it that looks like community building or, or certain kinds of leadership or whatever you might want to describe mm -hmm. it as, like, these are extras. And it's great that you did that. And we're super duper proud of you. But really what you're getting credit for is those three journal articles you published last year. We really need to stop and take a hard look at all of that and think about what a set of standards for tenure and promotion that genuinely upheld the values that we bring to the work that we're doing might look like. What is it that matters most to us? How do we know that the work that we're doing matters and how can we then, you know, build a career that doesn't run the risk of burning us out because we're trying to do absolutely everything, the stuff that we have to do plus the stuff that we want to do. Mm -hmm. But that allows us to really set a path toward what we consider success to be, how we're, we're working with students, how we're working with one another, how we're working with the community that allows us to determine what that success looks like and then set goals for ourselves and be assessed based on the goals that we set. It's, again, I mean, this is an extraordinarily heavy lift to say, you know, all institutions in the United States, you need to rethink your tenure and promotion processes. But I'm feeling more and more a desire to think about what a more balanced academic life that actually works toward the goals, the deep goals that we really have, rather than the goals that we're told we have to have, mm -hmm. might look like. I would love to work with a set of institutions that really felt strongly about thinking about how that might happen, how we might invent a new way of being within the academy that that doesn't just allow us a little bit of space to build community, but that in fact prioritizes community building as a key component of the work that we do. Along with that, I think something that is relatively obvious to anyone working in humanities is that we are not trying particularly for individual gains, like that's not why we got into this. And it's not the things that we're trying to instill in our students. We're trying to build better communities, democracies, groups of thinkers and engaged intellectuals, you know, like it's a, it helps communities everywhere if we can do the kind of work that we want to do, especially in the humanities, but more broadly in the university. I think that's exactly right. And you make a great case for it. And I want to just make everyone see that. <laughs> Not everyone does see that. And in fact, no. as you mentioned, it's more and more seen as an individual, you know, how much am I spending versus how much will I get paid my first year out of undergrad or out of grad school? And that's how we're more and more encouraged to a lot of people build stronger arguments using that as a basis for why we shouldn't fund a lot of these things, especially the things that do not result in sort of immediate gains financially for our graduates, yes. which of course I would like to see too, but not the only reason for going to university. How have you found making that case, especially to those maybe outside arts and humanities who are perhaps less willing or, or less uh, familiar with the idea that the university is for a greater good as opposed to individual gains? How have you, how have you built that and how have you found what's effective in talking to groups about that? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, 
I think that there is an increasing amount of data out there that shows that, in fact, humanities majors, liberal arts majors broadly, after the first couple of years out of school, begin rapidly to catch up with their engineering and business peers in terms of earning potential. Right. So we can turn back to, you know, the the more traditional pecuniary measures, individualistic measures of what success looks like and say that you can be an English major and you can go on to have a really financially successful life if that is the thing that you are aiming for. But there's also a lot of studies out there. You know, the Humanities Indicator Project um, has recently released a study that demonstrates that not only is that that financial level of, of success true among humanities graduates, but humanities graduates are also happy hmm. in what they do. They like their jobs. They like the lives that they build, and more so than in a lot of other fields. And I think having that kind of conversation about about happiness and about what it is that we're after in building the lives that we're building is is a really key component. That having been said, I think there is also, I mean, that, that all still leaves everything at the individual level, right? This mm. has become the dominant narrative within talking about higher education, that the purpose of higher education is for some kind of individual achievement or advancement, whether it's, it's individual achievement that is financially based or that if it has some other kind of more internal, non-financial basis. It's nonetheless individual. And a big part of what I, I want to argue is that we once, at least for a very brief moment, understood that the purpose of higher education was not just individual in nature, but that it served a social good for us to have a broadly educated public equipped with the tools for social mobility, that this was a larger good than was serving any individual. And that's why higher education needed to be funded at the social level rather than at the individual level. Making that argument today is really hard because it goes against everything in contemporary culture, which is increasingly privatized and increasingly understands all of these responsibilities for education and for other forms of getting ahead as being individual responsibilities rather than social responsibilities. But I think the more that we are able to say that you know, we find ourselves in the, the somewhat desperate cultural situation we're in today precisely because we've lost track of what the social good might be and that we need to really return our attention to that social good and to think about how we are in the university, not just building individual citizens, but in fact, building a society, the better off we'll be. Coming back around to the conversation we were having earlier about the diverse communities on our campuses to whom we're, we haven't been listening adequately. There are many students on our campuses who come from communities of color, who come from rural communities, who come from places where they are the first member of their family to go to college, mm -hmm. who recognize that their role in going to college and get this getting this education is not just about them individually, that it's about bringing the work that they, they do and the knowledge that they gain within the university back to their communities, back to their families, back to the people that they care about. And if we were to listen more closely to those students, to those families, to those communities, and find out what higher education means to them and how they understand its role in building strong social networks and strong structures of community support. I mean, we might really learn something new about what the university is for and how we might turn its direction in the future. I think that's such an excellent way to wrap up our conversation is with that sort of inspiring look towards a future that's not set, but will necessarily involve a lot of conversation and with uh, groups that are not necessarily and have not necessarily been in conversation with the university for a while. Kathleen, I just want to thank you so much for speaking to me today about your book, Generous Thinking. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's exactly, I think, what I needed and I think what a lot of us need when we can get very depressed looking at uh, certain things that we're hearing about higher ed. And yeah, it's a, it's a great and inspiring book. So thank you for writing it as well. 
Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. Be sure to check out Kathleen's recommended readings at tinapp.org. And in two weeks from now, I have a great interview that I've just recorded with Ken Krimstein, author and illustrator of the book, The Three Escapes of Hannah Arendt. So be sure to check that out two weeks from now. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers. Cheers.